started. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Emmy Chilton. I am the president of Austin Women in Technology uh, for a few more months. And I'm super excited for tonight's event, Overcoming Intimidation and communication, Communicating Effectively in a Male-Dominated Work Environment with Nicole Pletka. I've known Nicole Pletka for, for several years now, so I'm super excited to have her as a speaker. All right, Denise, can we go to the next slide? All right, our sponsors. So much of what we do as, as a board and as a group is made possible by our sponsors, so we're super grateful that they have all contributed to our success. We have Sears Logic, Apex Systems, Digital Turbine, PIMCO, Sauna, Charles Schwab, Axiom, Clear Data, BB Imaging, Revel IT, FDM Group, and ShipStation. We've had many longstanding relationships with several of these vendor or these sponsors, and we're super excited that they continue to support us. Right, up next. All right, I guess we're, we're going to turn it over to Shay for our breakouts. In all of your uh, breakout rooms, we are going to be moving into our speaker this evening, which is uh, the lovely Nicole Pletka, who has been a longtime AWT uh, member, and uh, I'm going to introduce her right now. So Nicole is a visionary leader with over 15 years of experience in project management. She started her career in anthropology and environmental science and found her passion for tech using GIS to answer archaeological hypotheses in her master's research. She's an expert for, uh, program and portfolio uh, management, project manage office implementation, and software development life cycles. Nicole has found success in industries including software, hardware, consulting, and the public sector. She excels in making uh, order out of chaos, coordinating teams that collaborate effectively and enjoyably, and she believes in uh, strength based leadership, self-organizing -organiz teams, and the power of a great handshake. Take it away, Nicole. So I didn't mean, <laughs> I feel like that was quite the tongue twister for you, Shay. <laughs> it, was a, it was a smidge. It's really small, so it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. That was very kind and wonderful introduction. Um, all right, let me share my screen and get going with the presentation. Okay. Okay, can everybody see the slides? Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Could you make it uh, the full slideshow? I thought I did. Hard to see. How's that? There we go. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. All right, so here's a really long title for you Overcoming Intimidation and Communicating Effectively in a Male Dominated Environment. Um, so when I heard AWT wanted to hear about this topic, I was pretty excited to speak about it. Um, because this is kind of near and dear to me. Being in male dominated environments is something that is not new to me. Um, a little bit about me, I know Shay just gave a, a nice long introduction. Um, and as she mentioned, I did not really ever think I was going to be in technology. I really thought I was going to be a scientist. I wanted to be an archeologist for a very long time. And what you may not know about being an archeologist is you start by working in the field. So and by in the field, I mean working in construction, uh, monitoring construction workers and making sure that they're not bulldozing a whole bunch of archeological sites or working with military and making sure they're not bombing a whole bunch of archeological sites. Um, now, after you spend many, many years getting really, really dirty and working uh, in the field, you decide, well, at least I decide, I wanna wear nice clothes and wear pointy shoes and um, get out of the field. So after working in the hot sun all day, I would work on my own personal research. And I decided to work on GIS projects and work on my master's research. And that kind of blended um, environmental science and uh, doing some technology research. And so I went from one male dominated field into another male dominated field, um, unbeknownst to me really. 
And so I got into technology and what ended up happening is I moved from being an individual contributor um, through doing my research to getting into project management and then resource management. And now I'm a director of project management and operations. So I'm effectively the operations director and COO of a small company called Sitecode right now. And so I'm in executive leadership positions. And so what I'm trying to show with this graphic is I've pretty much always worked in male dominated environments. And I'm showing one out of every 10 people in these jobs or two, maybe three are women, but really each of these men shown on this, on this graphic could be about five men. I mean, I couldn't even find an icon that was a woman, if you look at the military one. Um, not a lot of ladies in these jobs. Um, past 20 plus years, it's been me and the boys. So this is where I've spent most of my life. Now, I've got a handful of stories of things like this, where I've got someone yelling in my face. <laughs> um, this guy that I'm showing is a sergeant. I'm going to tell you a story of what happened to me the very first time I was put in charge of anything. Now, I was a crew chief working on a military base in Gila Bend, Arizona. And if you've never heard of Gila Bend, Arizona, I don't blame you. I think maybe five people live there. Um, it is the middle of nowhere. It is an active bombing range right on the border. And it gets to be about 120 degrees in the shade by about noon. So what happened there is I was in charge of a few archeologists who had to ride with a group of explosive ordnance disposal technicians. And so what we did is we rode in their trucks to make sure that they didn't drive over archeological sites while they were trying to pick up bombs that didn't explode. This was a super fun job, <laughs> very strange job that not very many people get to do. Um, but what happened on my very first day doing this, my very first day being in charge and I was 23 years old and I'm not a particularly large person. Um, and it was five o'clock in the morning and the sergeant who was in charge of the military side marches over to me. He's a good head taller than me in his military fatigues and his, you know, guns and all the other accoutrements that he's got on his belt. You know how they're always wearing 10,000 different things on their waist. Who knows what all those different pieces of equipment do. Um, marches over, gets literally two inches from my face and screams at the top of his lungs, whatever happens today, don't you dare slow us down. I don't know this person from Adam. I have never met this person in my life. And this is my first day on the job. I just stand there. First thing in the morning, I have not had any coffee yet, mind you. And my heart is beating out of my chest. But I need to be a leader to my team. And so I just say, I would just like you to remember that I'm a civilian. And he just has this big huff and he turns around and he walks back to his truck. And so then I just direct my staff, you please go over here, you please go over here, you please go over here. And I said, I will be riding with that lovely Sergeant. So I have a lovely day in silence the entire day <laughs> with him. And 
I don't know who, but someone on his team told his superior how he treated me that morning. And he was told that he needed to come and apologize because that is not the way the military is supposed to treat civilian contractors. I did not lose my cool and I am very proud of myself for that. Um, I feel like I was very effective that morning. But what I wanna say about that is that is one of a handful of stories that I have over my career of being the one woman in this male dominated environment. Most of the time, I was treated with a lot of respect. Most of the time, the men, the other women, the other people I worked with were great. There were still a lot of intimidating situations that I had to deal with being a minority for one reason or another. Being a minority because I was a woman, because I was the youngest person on the job, because I was the newest person on the job for whatever reason. You know, there are stressful situations that I was in. So what I wanna talk about in my next slide is kind of the difference between being intimidated because of a stressful situation versus what that sergeant did, which was intentional intimidation, okay? Because there's different communication tactics that I think you need to use in these different kinds of situations, okay? So your typical being intimidated, this is when no one is actively trying to hurt us. This is when you're just in a stressful situation just because the nature of where you are and who you are, right? And who you are relative to the people around you. Okay, so here's another story that I wanna tell you to kind of highlight the difference. One of my first jobs um, when I came, when I moved to Texas, and that was about 15 years ago, is I worked for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And I was working for the Information Technology Division and I was the liaison to the wildlife division. Now, surprise, surprise, the wildlife division is made up of a bunch of cowboys or what to me, move, you know, moving here from California, they all look like cowboys to me. They've got their hats on and their Wrangler jeans and their cowboy boots and they use colloquialisms like, tell me if I need to rope calf or, you know, it's all these little, things that describe horses and fish and things that I didn't understand. Um, but anyway, they were very, very nice. But I had to describe what the information technology could do to improve the efficiency of their business operations using technology. And their leadership group was composed of about 20 people 19 men and one woman, and they had an offsite where they went to one of the state parks and I had to give them a presentation about what IT could do for them. Now, when I walked in to where I was to give this presentation, the room was set up kind of in a horseshoe where I would stand in the middle and everyone else is sitting, you know, behind you know tables that are set up so that I'm in the middle and it feels like there's no way out. You know, every all eyes are on me, right? So that's kind of intimidating, right? You're you're standing there. I am I've only been in the job for about a month. I'm the only person that's not part of wildlife. I'm the only person not wearing cowboy boots. I'm <laughs> one of two women. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't even own Wranglers. <laughs> um, it's been known to me that they don't like people from California. Um, there's a lot of reasons why I'm feeling a little bit intimidated, okay? Now, as I get up there to start talking, I introduce myself, I describe my topic, and one of the men, and I remember he's sitting to my left, kind of catty corner, we'll call him Joe. 
I usually call most of the men in my stories Joe. If you if we have time at the end, I'll I'll explain why I call everyone Joe. Um, he says, you know, last time we had an outsider in here. She ran away crying within the first five minutes. And he leans back and crosses his arms. Let's see how well you do. So that turned it into intentional intimidation. And so I say, good luck with that. I'd like to get on with my presentation now. So that turned it into being intimidated because of the situation to intentional intimidation. So hopefully you can see the difference, right? Um, so that's when things get bad, when people kind of start intentionally attacking you, that's when we need to take some different measures, all right? But most of the time, most of the time, again, I wanna reiterate, most of the time people, um, I almost said a bad word, most of the time people aren't jerks. <laughs> so we're gonna start by talking about some standard communication rules that we can use all the time that will help us at least appear that we're not intimidated, okay? Even when we're feeling intimidated. So how can we appear that we're not intimidated? How can we speak like the bosses that we really are, the boss ladies that we are as members of AWD? All right. So some standard rules that we should always, that we should always employ. One, none of this is rocket science, okay? So hopefully we can all do it. Listen actively. Make sure you're on topic, right? Whenever you're in a meeting or, or giving a presentation even, make sure that you are on topic and that you're adding value when you're speaking. Now, this may seem pretty easy, but I cannot tell you how many times people say something that's already been said. People are just reiterating things that you've already heard. Okay, you don't, you don't necessarily need to do this, right? Reference previous speakers and add on to that. Be constructive with what you're saying, okay? And when you're giving a presentation, don't think that you don't need to listen. I'm watching all of you on the sidebar. I'm listening to your body language. I'm seeing you nod your head, right? Or not pay attention to me or maybe start nodding off if I'm being really boring. Um, so I think you should always be listening actively and paying attention to what your audience is doing, what other participants in the meeting are doing and use that in your communication. Next, get the attention of the other people in the room. Now, I luckily came from a family of lawyers. Now, luckily is a word that I, that I use. Other people may not say that that's a lucky thing to have come from, but I came from a family where we're all speaking loudly, constantly, constantly speaking. And so I learned that subtle art of when do you get in a word in edgewise? How do you artfully interrupt when you're in a conversation, when people are, when everyone's trying to say something? How do you, how do you grab their attention? How do you say, I have something to say? Okay. Don't ask permission to speak. You've already been invited to the meeting. You've already been asked to be there. You've already been given permission to speak just by nature of your presence. And generally speaking, if you say, can I please say something? No other attendee of the meeting is actually there to grant you that permission. Sometimes there's a facilitator, but really you may just be causing an awkward pause in the meeting because who's gonna be the one to say, oh yes, yes, please say something, right? Um, so just more or less demand it. I need to add to that. It's important that I follow on to what Joe's saying, right? 
create enough of an introduction to what you're going to say that other people stop talking and start listening to you, right? So it's just enough, even if it's just a like, um, excuse me, just enough to get your word in there. Don't start your point. If you start your point without some kind of a clause, it may get missed. So some kind of, I need to add to that and then start speaking can be very powerful. So state your need for attention. Okay, the next one's really important. Put your bottom line up front. And in some of the breakout rooms, I heard a lot of people talking about being direct, being too direct, not being direct enough. Um, this is important. And this is what I mean by put your bottom line up front. And where I got this acronym from, interestingly, is from a military handbook on communication effectiveness. What this means is the correct amount of directness. One, not being direct enough generally means you're sugarcoating the message or you're saying the why you need something before you're saying what you need. Okay. Now, being too direct often means you're saying something negative before you're saying the what you need. Okay, so I'm going to try and give an example. Let's say you need a report to be run. I need someone to run a report about mm, why the numbers are low in, on some you know, marketing thing that we're doing, okay? Now, if you say, sometimes we do a good job when these things happen, but sometimes we don't. I mean, I think you're doing a great job most of the time, but sometimes I worry that we're not trying hard enough. So do you think maybe we can do an extra report? I mean, only if you have time. It's not, I mean, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think the numbers are okay? I mean, I'm not sure, but maybe they are. A report might be helpful. Do you think a report would be helpful? Like that's not being direct about, you need a report, okay? Too direct might be, your numbers were terrible. <laughs> we're not bringing in enough money. Run a report, figure out why. That's just unkind, you know? And so like being too direct can mean you're not using the tact and the empathy that you need to make somebody feel okay about the work you're asking them to do. Not being direct enough means they may not even understand if it's important that they do that work, right? Um, so when you're being appropriately direct, it's a focused message what you need, when you need it, why it's important in that order. Okay, so put the bottom line up front. Focus message, what you need, when you need it, why you need it. Okay, and following along with that, clear is kind, clear is kind. And if you've heard this phrase before, hopefully it's because you listen to Brene Brown podcasts or you read Brene Brown books. She's amazing. If you don't listen to her stuff, I highly recommend that you do. Um, she's a badass. She is a researcher on uh, shame and some other things. Um, but she says clear is kind and where I'm using that here is using the right words at the right time. And what I mean is don't use jargon, don't use acronyms, don't use long words when you don't have to. Basically remember that the point of communication is to be understood. First and foremost is making sure you're being understood. Don't worry about being the smartest person in the room 
making sure everyone knows that you know more than they do and that you went to the best school and that you're hyper intelligent. The point of communication is to make sure that everyone in the room understands what you're trying to tell them. Okay, if they don't know what you're trying to say because you used some, you know, huge long word to sound super smart, they may just think you're being smug and they may be off put by it to the point that they just don't even like you. <laughs> and they're just gonna get hung up on not liking you and they're gonna miss the point on what you're trying to communicate anyway. Um, now, the next one is keep it short and simple. Now I know the KISS acronym sometimes means keep it short and stupid or some other things, but I like the nice version of keep it short and simple. And I've coached people on this for many years. Um, if it's written communication, especially if you're disagreeing with something that someone says, if you have more than three sentences to make your point, um, definitely call a meeting. If you see yourself try, starting to write a novel, an email, um, just stop. Just stop and pick up the phone or call a meeting because chances are it's gonna get misinterpreted and you're gonna piss somebody off. So just talk to them. Like I swear to God, it will be more and more effective. Um, and if you're talking, try it if you can to remember that someone's trying probably to write down what you're saying. And speak in bullets, speak in a way that shows you're being thoughtful of note takers of scribes, of the people in the meetings who are trying to take note of what you're saying. Speaking in bullets and speaking in short sentences is so helpful. And I guarantee you will be the one with the words that go down in history. And, <laughs> and you will be the one that is remembered. Your decisions will be the ones that are remembered. Okay. But the cardinal rule, the one that you will find on everything that you read about how do I communicate effectively is be confident. Because you know, we're all just born confident. We all go through middle school, you know, and end up confident, right? I know I did. <laughs> just kidding. That's a joke because nobody goes through middle school and all the harassment that comes with it and ends up confident. Um, unless, I don't know, you, something crazy happened in your life and you lived in a bunker and the only people who talked to you were your parents. But um, the reality is confidence can be hard to come by. So what I'm gonna talk to you about is how to appear confident until you actually are confident. All right, so the ways you can appear confident, here are some of them anyway. One, be prepared. Oh, I just realized I haven't told the story for like a whole slide. <laughs> so I think it might be story time. Um, when I was in college, I decided, um, that I would give a talk at the Society for American Archaeology. This is a conference that happens once a year and it's a pretty big deal. Um, it's an international conference, um, North and South America. Um, not a lot of undergraduates give talks, but I was pretty big for my britches. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, now, I got in a little over my head and decided to give a presentation. But when I got there, I was terrified, like absolutely terrified. There were, as far as I can tell, no other undergraduates. And everyone in the audience was a good 20 years, 30 years, maybe 40 years older than me. It was like all professors and 
big universities. And I was, I just didn't know what I was doing there. But one of the graduate students who was there says, you know, no one knows your material like you do. Like literally, no one knows your material except for you. And I said, you know, you're right. I mean, how many people here know about early Neolithic um, stone tools in Northern Denmark? And then he's like, um, two, <laughs> literally two people <laughs> kind of in the world. And I'm like, yeah, I'm prepared and a uh, pretty obscure topic. So if you wanna be confident, talk about topics that nobody knows about. Um, but honestly, it really did fill me with confidence because I was prepared. I was prepared to talk about something that nobody else knew about. Um, and to this day, doing little things to prepare before speaking engagements, even if it's just a meeting, fills me with that little bit more confidence that makes me actually do better. For meetings, even meetings that I have on a biweekly basis, just reading the meeting notes beforehand, just taking that extra five minutes, right? If there's data to be reviewed, just looking at it over, right? And a lot of times nobody else does this. So even if I can just have one sound bite in a meeting that's like, well, last time, Joe said X and they're like, oh, he did, didn't he? And I can remember something that nobody else remembered. Actually makes you sound pretty good. And you'd be surprised at like how far that stuff goes. And next one, look alive. Again, so easy, just sitting up straight, making eye contact with other people in the room avoid fidgeting, just doing little things, just showing up, like really showing up to a meeting, being super present when you're there um, can make a huge difference. Um, if you act like you care that you're there the whole time and when other people are speaking, you're really engaged with the speaker you honestly may be, do, may be showing more confidence than other people in the room. Um, the next one, slow down when you're speaking. You will be surprised how much more confidence you will exude if you speak with intention. So many people speak very, very quickly when they're nervous. So just speaking a little more slowly will show that you care about the words that are coming out of your mouth. And holding a cat will always make you feel better. Sorry. <laughs> there is someone in the audience holding a cat right now. Um, another one, um, avoid minimizing words. And I don't know if y'all can tell, but I really am not being gender specific in most of my talk. But this is one area that I do find women do this a lot more than men. Women say, I just meant this, or I only, I only meant to say something, or I'm sorry to bother you. But the minimizing words is a habit of women that I find in, in women way more than I find in men. I don't know why we do this, but we really, really need to stop. Um, it changes the tone of a request dramatically. Um, if you were to say, you know, I just, I just need that report in two hours versus I need that report in two hours. It's the same request with such a different meaning, right? I just need it. Like, can you please do it? Versus I need it in two hours. I mean, you really expect it in two hours, 
right? So say it like you mean it, like you expect it. You're confident in your request. Um, and when you say, you know, the apologizing, sorry, I made a mistake. You can, you can absolutely admit that you made mistakes, but there's no reason to apologize. We all, we all make mistakes. And I can't tell you all the times that, you know, I left out an attachment in an email or I forgot an appendix on a document or something like that. You just don't have to apologize. You can say, you send an email, you forgot an attachment. You just send the next email that says, please refer to this email instead. Attachment X was neglected from the first one. I've never been chastised for, I can't believe you didn't apologize, right? I don't feel bad for forgetting things because I'm human. I'm allowed to be human. I'm confident in my humanness. I'm okay with it, right? It's really fine. Um, the next one is recovering quickly. Recovering quickly is huge. This, this is like showing how unflappable we are. Um, we're okay with ourselves. We're okay with the fact that we make mistakes and showing that you're okay with yourself is a good way to show that you're confident in yourself. And I love listening to NPR partially because I love hearing them make mistakes because they don't do it very often, but when they do, they gloss over it like, like bosses. Uh, like for instance, they will say the wrong name. And for instance, if they were to say, let me introduce you to Emmy, rather Heather, and just move on, just like that. And not like, I mean, I mean, Heather, I didn't mean to say Emmy. I'm so sorry, I, I, I forgot your name. You know, there's no, nobody gets flustered. They just keep going, right? They don't miss a beat and it's great. It really is great. And you know, one of my, one of my side hobbies is dancing. And they always say, you know, if you mess up, just smile bigger, just move on and smile bigger. And you know what? The audience will love you for it. And I and believe me, they do. The next thing. Mm -hmm. There we go. Admit you don't know. This is something that my father told me when I was very young, and it is very true. The smartest people are never afraid to say, I don't know. Because they're so confident in what they do know that they're not worried about being faulted for what they don't know, right? It's so much better to get back to people than to be wrong. And you can help, it can help you build relationships too. If you say, you know what? I don't know the answer to that question. I will get back to you tomorrow. Get back to them tomorrow. Keep your promises. Foster a relationship with somebody. It's great. Have the right answer. Have the right answer. Don't make stuff up. Don't be a, a BSer, right? It's totally okay to be confident in what you do know and say, I'm not sure about the things that you don't know. Next, be genuine. And this is another thing that somebody brought up in the breakout room, one of the breakout rooms that I was in. And I was so proud of them for saying it because being genuine is an awesome way to be confident. You are totally proud of who you are and you're good with who you are. And you're also good with who you're not, right? Don't try to be funny if you're not funny. It's not gonna go, it's not gonna go over well, right? Also, don't try and be like, hyper analytical if that's not who you are. Like people can see right through that stuff. Um, but you know, if you are funny, make jokes, right? If you're good at it, it's great. Um, but just be careful not to alienate anybody. You know, make sure you do know your audience, make sure you're using examples that resonate and, and you'll do a great job. You really will. 
Um, the next one, know your role, know why you're there. Um, I don't know about you guys, but a few years ago, the whole like Sheryl Sandberg, like lean in, make sure you always talk, make sure you always have a place at the table, um, make sure you always say something. Now this was great advice 80% of the time, in my opinion. Now, because sometimes you need to make sure that you were actually invited to the meeting to talk. If you were invited to the meeting to have a voice and to speak, definitely lean in and be there for that. But sometimes you're going to be invited to be a listener, right? You're going to be invited to observe. And so if that's your role, or if you're there to be a scribe, don't feel obligated to say something, okay? It is totally okay to be an observer or a listener if that's what your role is. Now, if you're not sure why you were invited to a meeting, it is critical that you ask whoever invited you or you ask the facilitator what their expectation is from you, what they're expecting your role to be for that meeting. Um, because you wanna fulfill that role and you wanna do it well. And the best way to be confident that you're doing a good job in any meeting or any presentation is to make sure the expectations of you are known to you, especially, and also to the people who are there. Um, but an example of this is, you know, in my job today, uh, I'm a consultant. And so a lot of times if I'm listening to, you know, a business and like my clients talk about the strategy for their company, I'm not going to tell them necessarily what their strategy should be. I'm going to listen to requirements for a system we're building for them. But at my company, I am on the leadership team. So if we're talking about strategy for my company, you better bet I'm going to speak up and say what I think the strategy needs to be. Right? So in both meetings, we're talking about corporate strategy. In one, I'm speaking if it affects the requirements for a system, but I'm not going to tell them how they should run their business. And the other one, we're not building a computer system, but I am going to speak up if we're talking about a corporate strategy, right? And so knowing the role and why I'm in the meeting has a really big impact on what I'm speaking to and how much I'm speaking in the meeting. So I hope that makes sense. Um, lastly, please, please avoid distractions. Um, it just is is good to put yourself on do not disturb so that you can follow all the standard rules, all the other confidence rules. You really can't follow all the other rules if you're distracted. Um, if you are going to be distracted, like you have a family member in the hospital or something else is horrible is happening, just inform the meeting facilitator or other people beforehand. It's just the polite right thing to do um, or avoid going altogether. Okay, now, what you're going to do, hopefully, until you actually start feeling confident, you're going to pretend to be confident until you actually start becoming confident. And this is what it's going to feel like. Feeling intimidated is going to go down. Over time, you're going to feel less and less and less intimidated, and you're going to feel more and more and more confident, right? Um, so like right now for me, because I've been doing this for what feels like a bajillion years, um, I'm not gonna, I really don't wanna tell you how many years because I don't want you to know how old I am. That's what makeup is for. Um, I, I, I don't feel so intimidated. I feel confident speaking. I enjoy speaking in front of everyone, but that's not how it was when I was in college doing speaking engagements for the first time, right? But it takes practice, it takes reflection, it takes time to do things, to do things well and to, to actually enjoy it. Um, but how do you get there? You practice, you practice, you practice, just do it, you just keep doing it. Um, and you talk about things you care about. And also you find advocates, you find people who care about you and who are willing to help you. 
and you coach them. Um, advocates don't just like grow on trees. Um, so guess what guys, it's story time. I'm gonna tell you about an advocate of mine um, who was not a natural born advocate. Um, super nice man, but he thought that being a good advocate meant sitting next to me in meetings and putting his hand on my wrist or on my knee anytime I said something brilliant. Now, I don't really think that's a great thing to do. Um, it really was not awesome. And so he was, you know, I was, I was in my early thirties and he hired me to be a project manager and he wanted to show his support. And so he would come to some of my meetings. And as I was trying to run the meetings, you know, he would sit next to me and literally go like, I completely agree with you and put his, and put his hand on my wrist or put his hand on my knee sometimes, which was even worse. And it would shock me. And I would look at him and I kept thinking like, he's got to get the message by these looks of utter shock that I'm giving him that this is not okay. No, no, not getting the message at all. And so one day I took him outside and I'm like, Mr. Joe, it's always Joe, I hope you're understanding this now. Um, I, I really need you to stop touching me. And he's like, but I'm just a touchy feely guy. I said, I understand, but I need people to think that you hired me based on merit, not because you think I'm cute. And he's like, nobody thinks that. I said, really? Everybody thinks that because of your behavior. Unfortunately, your behavior is sending the wrong message. He said, but I'm just trying to support you. I really want people to know that I like you and I appreciate you and I think you're doing a great job. He said, then I really, really, really need you to stop touching me. He's like, well, then how do I show people that I support you? <laughs> you use your words. <laughs> I'm like literally saying things to my boss that I say to my children. You use your words, sir. And <laughs> um, and honestly, he said, he says, I really, he's like, I really do want to try. I really do want you to be successful. And I said, okay. And I said, and I really like this job and I really do want this to work out. I really do. I said, but it's very, very important to me that people don't have the wrong impression because it is undermining my credibility and it's actually making my job 10 times more difficult. And he got the message and he said, so how should I treat you? And I said, how would you show support for a fishing buddy? And he's like, are you serious? And I said, yeah. He said, what if one of your fishing buddies caught like a huge fish? <laughs> because I don't know anything about fishing. <laughs> I'm like, how would you show him that you were super proud? <laughs> and I'm like, use that kind of attitude. And he's like, okay okay, I think I could do that. And honestly, he sat on the other side of the table and he used words of affirmation and he started being a great advocate. And I rose through the ranks and I started doing really well. And honestly, like, I, I became one of the leads of their project management office after a few years. And it went really well, but he needed some serious coaching. 
But I think, you know, and honestly, other women in the office started thanking me because he started treating them differently too and started asking them how they felt about it. And he started to change and it was good. Um, so hard conversations are worth it. Um, so I recommend that. But in the end, because he was willing to change, I did end up becoming more confident and being less intimidated and things were great in the end. Um, so, however, this is how, this is the trajectory that everyone should go on. This is how you want things to go. However, it's not how it always goes. Sometimes um, things hit the fan. What's the nice way to say that? Things go south. Things go poorly. Um, things get ugly. That's what I put on the slide. Uh, okay. Now there's a really good quote by Winston Churchill. It says, you will never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. All right. And what we mean here is your destination, this is your career, right? This is where you wanna go in life. Now, throwing stones and the dogs that bark, the dogs that bark are the people who are big jerks to you. These are the people that come after you. These are the intentional intimidators, right? And throwing stones at them, this is like, I don't know if you've heard that phrase, but just because you're invited to a fight doesn't mean you have to show up, okay? This is what we mean here. Sometimes keeping your dignity, keeping your self-respect, all of that, is more important than just about anything else. And so for the rest of the presentation, we're gonna talk a little bit about how we do that. Um, and one thing I wanna say about it is that intentional intimidation, it can really occur at any level of your career. From, you know, starting out your very first job to, you know, your management executive level. And in all honesty, I kept thinking that it would get better and better. But the reality is it doesn't. Um, as I've risen through the ranks, I've honestly found that it's gotten more and more brutal. Um, a lot of times, kind of in the earlier parts of my career, it was more people just kind of trying to punch their way to the top. Um, but as I've gotten higher in the ranks, there's a lot of people trying to push people down and it's gotten more personal and it's gotten more difficult. Um, so as much as it's terrible to say, um, those early experiences are horrible, but they really can help toughen you up and get you ready for what you're gonna need to face as you get higher in the ranks. Um, but always be a leader, always communicate a message about how people should be treated, how you think people should be treated. Always be the leader that you want to have and that who you want to be. Um, so even if your boss's boss, you know, invites you to a strategy meeting and you're like so excited because you're like, I get to play with the big guns and everyone thinks my opinion is so important. And then he says in the middle of the meeting, why don't you just calm down, honey bunny? And you're so horrified. You maintain your dignity. You figure it out. You figure out how to stay professional and talk to HR leader. Um, so what do you do? And sometimes, well, first of all, the first thing that I always like to do is try to understand where people are coming from, right? Like why, are, why do people treat you like this to begin with? Why are people being such bullies, you know? 
Um, like, where is it coming from? Um, I mentioned Brené Brown in the beginning and her research on shame. And I really do believe that this kind of terrible behavior does stem from shame. Um, now, according to Men's Resource Center, day-to-day -day small humiliations that most undermine men's self-esteem, self-esteem, some crazy things, forgetting names of guys on sports teams, lacking sense of directions, computer stuff, car stuff, public speaking, um, in the presence of other men feeling dominated by women. So imagine I'm the one woman in a meeting, with a bunch of dudes, and I am kicking ass, right? I'm, I've got this great presentation, awesome strategy, how things should go. And maybe I'm even making an argument that's out arguing somebody else. Well, some guy could potentially feel dominated by a woman in front of other men. So what's gonna happen? Well, perhaps they're having a bad day, perhaps other things are happening with them. They may act out their own bullying to deal with it, unfortunately for me. Um, so Brené Brown, who I mentioned before, she points out when men are repeatedly shamed, they either get pissed off or shut down. Sooner or later, many of them explode. Many of them don't. Many of them actually have enough emotional intelligence and can handle it and they're fine. Um, but sometimes they do explode um, and we get to bear the brunt of it. So what do we do? How do we handle it? How do we stay professional? Um, I'm gonna tell you how I handle it. Now, everyone can have their own tactics, but I'm gonna tell you what I do. Um, and what I do is called over control. Now, these are called over control themes. This comes from psychology and it's something that I didn't necessarily even know I was doing until talking to my therapist. Uh, it actually turns out to be pretty effective at work, but um, don't necessarily recommend this as part of something to do at home with loved ones. We'll get into that. But what happens is, is inhibited emotional expression. And so I generally am a very big expressive smiling, happy person. But when I'm attacked, I kind of go into crisis management mode. The inhibited emotional expression is I go very flat, very stone faced, and my gestures um, become very small. Um, I become very almost robotic. Uh, so we can go to our, our friend, the robot. Um, and then I have my overly cautious and hypervigilant behavior, right? So this is when I become very, very considerate of every word that comes out of my mouth, right? So if you think I talk a little more slowly when I'm you know, trying to be confident, I talk even more slowly and cautiously so that anything I say cannot be used against me, is extra considerate, is definitely uh, appropriate. It is nothing hurtful towards that person. It is only, it is only fact-based. It is just to make the point that I need to make um, the rigid and rule governed behavior. This is making sure I am completely compliant with any HR rules, any office rules, any behaviors to make sure I am not, you know, losing my temper. I'm not doing or saying anything that can be taken out of context and, you know, saying that I'm doing anything inappropriate. It's basically setting up the stage that this other person did something inappropriate, 
but I am a stellar, perfect, honorable, wonderful, perfect employee. Um, and the aloof and distant relationships is just me remembering that this is just work. This is not personal. This person is not, does not rank as someone who is allowed to affect my feelings. Right there, it is up to me to decide who is allowed to affect my emotions. And this person does not get to be one of them. Okay, now you do not treat loved ones like this. This is very, very important, right? This is just something you do for like a crisis management type situation, right? So you're in a crisis, you're like someone, this is like the sergeant in the beginning who's literally yelling in your face, right? This isn't just someone who's, you know, casually interrupting you because they have, you know, ADD, right? This is someone who's really trying to hurt you. Um, and you need to make sure it's clear that you are, it's clear that you're offended and you're protecting yourself, but you're maintaining your cool you're maintaining your calm. You are being professional, but you're also clear that you are not okay with being treated like this, but you are not fighting. You're not going to, you're not going to fight. You're not going to be a difficult person back. You're not going head to head with this person. The types of things you might say in that situation, um, you know, or things like, I no longer feel this meeting is being productive. Um, something like, it doesn't appear we're going to be able to come to a decision. This may be a good time to adjourn the meeting. We may need additional stakeholders to attend. We may need to escalate decision making to additional people, you know, but basically make it clear that collaboration is not happening. You're not fighting, but you're also not agreeing. Um, so something, and it's also something where Good to, if your boss is not there, good thing to talk to your manager about afterwards, or your, if you are a manager, talk to your director. Um, but hopefully these things don't happen very often. Now, something to note, and I wanna to get to in the next slide, is that if somebody yells at you, generally our first impulse is to yell back. Okay, and I'm urging you guys not to, and I know you want to say like, but I am tough and I am a good fighter and I'm a good debater. Um, I can go head to head with people. Let me tell you, like I can fight like the best of them. I will fight with my husband. I will fight with my brother. I will fight with my sister. I will fight with a lot of people. <laughs> um, but in a work situation, it's generally not in your best long-term interest. And this is, and I want to tell you why. Um, these people are being bullies, okay? Bullies aren't using good rational decisions. They're not fighting fair. They're fighting with strong arm tactics. And work, the business place, this is not the right place for those kinds of tactics, okay? And arguing can have really bad consequences. For one, you could lose. Uh, you could appear petulant, right? And I know for me, when I start getting really heated, the emotions start to rise. I could cry. I don't want to cry um, at work. I don't want someone to think they got the better of me. And this is not to say that it's always bad to cry at work. I've definitely cried at work. Um, you know, tough conversations, if people are being, you know, laid off, there's appropriate times to cry at work. Um, but not when I'm trying to win an argument. Um, also, sometimes when people get in a fight at work, nobody remembers who started the fight. They just remember who was in it. 
and I don't want to be remembered as somebody who fights. Um, also, people start thinking it's okay to talk to you this way. I don't want anyone to think that. So staying calm, staying calm can have great consequences. One, you could actually still win the argument, even if someone is yelling at you. I mean, again, going back to the sergeant, he yelled at me, but I said, you know, I stay calm. He had to apologize, right? People can see how well you handle stress. Everyone knows who started it. And even if you lose, you maintain your dignity. And I want to give you guys a real world example of what's happened like within the last two years at my current job is I worked with another consultant. Um, I was there as a consultant, consulting project manager and there was uh, contract developers on the project who were just awful. And um, I ended up being taken off the project by my boss because the developer was being so difficult and so awful. My boss happened to sit in on a meeting and this guy, we'll call him Cannoli Jew because he was very, new, he was from New York. Um, and he just yelled at me, like wouldn't speak to me in anything other than a yell. Um, and it was very difficult. The project was going really poorly. And he would say things like, just quit your yapping and let me do my job. And, and just was a terrible person. Um, and my boss said, I'm not letting any of my staff be treated like that. And he was like, we don't need the money for this job. This is ridiculous. He's like, I'm taking you off this project. They're on their own. Um, and the client finished the project with this developer. Um, it turned out horribly, but they finished without me on it. Now, six months later, they fired that developer and they asked my company to come back. And we're rebuilding the whole entire system because they like how I handled it. And now they're using our developers, our designers and me. So we're making about three times as much money on the redo of the project because of how calm and cool I stayed even when this person was terrible. So it works. So even though it seemed like we lost because they took me off the project, at the end of the day, we're making a ton more money off of it, right? So it's a good tactic. Keep your cool. The client actually really likes it and it's going to be better. So last thing I wanna say about it is if you have to go through this kind of a crisis, make sure you do complete the stress cycle. Acting in this over-controlled manner and resisting the urge to fight, it's okay every once in a while, but it's still really freaking stressful. Um, breathe, vent, cry, whatever. Just make sure you're actually doing okay on the inside as you appear on the outside. Um, there is a book called Burnout that will help you understand what the whole stress cycle is. Um, if you're not, right? So if, remember the graph that we talked about, like using the normal communication stuff. If you find that your, your intimidation is not going down, your confidence is not going up, and you're actually having more and more of the bad interactions and your confidence is going down or it's not getting better, um, you may be in a toxic workspace or you may have too many bad people around you. You may not be getting built up enough. Like pay attention to these signals um, and you may need some kind of a change. Um, I've been there, I've been there and I keep thinking it's me. I'm not doing a good job. There's something wrong with me my communication's off or my tactics are off or I could do better, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't me. It was these intentional intimidators who are just bullies and there was nothing, there's just sometimes nothing you can do. Um, and you have to go, you know what? I, you should be using the standard communication tactics 99% of the time. And if those aren't working and you're having to use over control or other tactics, 
more often, there's a bigger problem. Um, so what I want to end with is it takes grace to remain kind in cruel situations. And I hope we can all be graceful all the time. So thank you, AWT. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Nicole. Awesome. Definitely be sure to check out the, the chat because you got a lot of loving in there. And I was monitoring a little bit and I saw that you had answered pretty much every question that was asked as you went. So awesome job there. But thank you so much, Nicole, for, for sharing that, for all the tips and the tricks and the humanizing it, right? And the storytelling. And like I put in the chat, thank you for the male allies on here for not being those guys. But, you know, hopefully we can change some things going forward. And just thank you again. Any, any last minute questions or anything like that for Nicole before we jump over to who's hiring and who's looking? Awesome. Well, Nicole, check out the praises. That was a great job. So thank you. I have a question. Yeah, Grace. So there were so many good points that Nicole, you brought up. I was just like, <laughs> I was trying to take down everything. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, how do you deal with your feelings? And I know you recommended reading the book Burnout. But what I'm struggling with is I can present the robot form, but mm -hmm. feel horrible on the inside. And part of it is because of a traumatic childhood mm -hmm. that I'm still working through in therapy and things like that. So when someone yells at me, especially a male figure, it just does something on a total, totally different level. Um, and I've had that happen before at work in an inappropriate way. And so I'm just trying to figure out how do, how do you deal with that? No, that's a great question. Um, and it's like probably hours to address it. Um, yeah, I mean, that's like therapy, A, eh, for one thing. Um, you have to have a strong support system around you. I mean, one of the reasons like Heather and I are good friends is I think I went to an AWT event after one of my triggering situations and basically fell apart. Um, but yeah, it it happens and it will happen. And that's kind of why I ended with like making sure you finish that cycle. Um, if you do have too many um, times where you're kind of burying and burying and burying and just trying to get through it, you're, it's, it's gonna kill you on the inside. You know, it, it really is. So you do need to make sure that you're building yourself back up again um, and that's going to be different for every person, but you, but if it, if you just keep, if you let, you're going to keep cracking on the outside, you know, until those cracks get you on the inside, you got to figure out a way to heal. Hi, I'm going to chime in here. Um, one, I, I got a business coach about a year and a half ago. And so I would have those moments and when they would happen, I would be like, oh, I have got to call my coach because she is going to like, essentially she was kind of my business like therapist to help me get through those things. So that's why when we say you need a board of directors to help you through your career, these are the moments like when you're triggered like that, just try to keep your cool. Like Nicole has recommended and then have the, the, the network that you can voice out for support. Um, and it, 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 it's not an insignificant thing to be able to have somebody that you can call in the workday that you know is going to be able to, or and even if you have to wait a couple hours to say, hey, I can hang in there for a couple hours until this thing. And then, you know, I mean, that's, that's part of why we're here as an organization so that we can, we can support women and, you know, find a person who can, who can be that for you. And it can make all the difference in your day because it doesn't, because often if you can just get it out, it, then it doesn't eat you up on the inside. So, do we have any other questions, Heather? Not that I've seen yet. Oh, Diane Kenyon asked one, you know, one question is to ask yourself, what story are you telling versus what facts? Um, so there's some great points here in the chat. So definitely take a look at it. 
Um, absolutely. I know I want to do an AWT book club and I know a lot of these awesome books were shout out in there and a lot of us have read them. So thanks for all those tips there. Any, any more questions or thoughts people wanted to share? Well, awesome. Well, we will open this section up to who's hiring and who is looking. And if this is your first or one of your first ABT events, um, you know, in person, we were obviously able to network and meet up, but we wanted to make sure we didn't lose that when we went virtual. So that's why we still have the networking roulette, but we also have this venue because we know a lot of you are either already in Austin, maybe joining us virtually wanting to get into Austin because you're looking for a new job, you're looking for a mentor, you're breaking into a new career, you're hiring for different uh, parts of your organization. Uh, so we wanna open this up. So if you're hiring or looking, please unmute yourself, put it in the chat. Um, Maria, I already saw you posted the DIR postings in there, um, but definitely use this opportunity to showcase you and your experience, right? Don't be intimidated by this, but also if you're hiring, you know, what a great network and community. Um, and then reminder at the end, we will send an email out with a recap of these slides, the recording, as well as all the postings and people looking. Um, and also if you're an A to B T member, you can directly connect with people in Slack as well. So who's hiring and who's looking? Hello everyone, I'm Happiness and I'm a recruiter at Digital Turbine. We're the leaders in the mobile app delivery space. We are hiring in areas of tech, revenue, and reporting. And I'm gonna go ahead and share the link to our career page in the chat. So please feel free to have a look and connect with myself and my colleague, Russell Jones is also in the room. Yes, Digital Turbine, we love our sponsor partners there. So absolutely check those out. Thanks for posting those in the chat. Uh, Stacy, I saw that you posted about Integral. Do you want to unmute and talk about any of those? Sure. Thanks, Heather. So um, Integral is a SaaS company that's actually owned by Enterprise Holdings. Um, I noticed that you have a USAA badge on your shirt. I recognize the logo. Um, but uh, Integral creates software for the collision, auto collision space. So anything that has to do with insurance companies, body shops, EOMs, MSOs, anything that has to do with the auto collision, we create software for that. And we have quite a few positions open. Um, me personally, on my team, I need a technical sourcer. That would be a full-time position. These are all full-time. Um, we also need several different full stack developers, operations engineers, scrum masters, agile coaches. Um, so if you're interested, feel free to message me. I'm on the Slack channel um, or you could DM me. Thank you. So Jenna, I saw you posted some in there. Denise. I did. Hi, yeah. everyone. I'm Jenna Kuntz. Um, this is my first AWT meeting, so it's really great to be here with you all. Um, I'm with a company called Financial Force. We are a uh, cloud provider for PSA, or professional services automation, and ERP software in the cloud built natively on top of Salesforce. So if you have any experience that resembles that and you're interested in a senior solution architect role post sales, uh, please, please reach out to me. I would love to hear from you. That role is specifically on my team. Um, we're, we're a global team, so that, that is a US-based role. Um, we have other roles as well. So if you wanna check out financialforce.com and check out our career page, we are uh, growing like crazy and we would love to uh, see, see you out there applying for roles with us. I'll go. <laughs> My name is Haley Lamond and I work for SailPoint. I'm actually the global facilities ma manager. So though I work at a tech company, I have a very non-tech job. Um, my department isn't directly hiring, but I reached out to our ladies of SailPoint group to see if any of the managers on there had any open roles and I got some feedback. So we have a uh, senior data engineer for our identity AI platform. We have a senior UI engineer for platform UI. We also have a senior web developer role. And we also have one more uh, workday administrator. We're also hiring like crazy in our engineer department overall. So we are actively, actively looking. Awesome. And make sure you drop some of these in the chat if you can, uh, so that we can, again, save all this information. Yeah. Hi, Denise Iglesias. And um, 
I'm vice president of engineering at Dealerware. And um, basically we are in automotive uh, fleet management and mobility solutions. Um, it is a SaaS application. Um, if you go to the dealership and you need a service loaner or you wanna rent a car, we're basically helping automotive dealerships with digital transformation. Um, so we have um, software engineers, product managers, a professional services manager, uh, data warehouse engineer. I dropped the link uh, into the chat. We have all sorts of positions open. Awesome. And I know Tanya, you posted, Diane, Christy, Grace, Eliza, keep them coming. Yeah. Hey, this is Tanya. Um, thank you very much. Um, I am the IT development manager at TDLR and I have a team of about 13 um, web developers. And we are looking constantly because <laughs> um, we don't seem to get a lot of um, uh, applications anymore. I guess mm, maybe it's the unemployment still. I'm not really sure. But um, anyway, so our job is um, posted on work in Texas and also on the TD TDLR site. And this is actually for our new licensing system. So it's new architecture, new um um, let's see, I'm trying to think, oh gosh, I can't remember, like it's JavaScript and um, hmm, GitHub and Azure, ADO, um, so it's all, it's new, um, a lot of uh, really uh, a large um, learning curve for our folks because we have a lot of legacy <laughs> systems currently that will be transitioning, that's all, thank you. Um, I also wanted to hop in and share that I am looking. I uh, recently graduated from a web development boot camp, and so I'm looking for um, either full stack or front end roles. Awesome. Hopefully, there's some good Hi. things you can make One here. More. Hi, I'm Susan Fern, and I'm an experienced man engineering manager with customer facing and business line experience. And I'm making a transition to the world of software. And I'm really excited to join a company that has a culture that supports team building and people development and continuous improvement. And I'd like to bring my leadership skills to this new space. I would love to hear about opportunities. Hi, everybody. I guess I might be the last one. My name is Grace. I am looking for opportunities for mentoring. I moved from Michigan uh, to San Antonio right before COVID. And um, I have experience in software development. I put some information in the chat. Um, I'm more so focused right now on digital literacy um, and helping adults to develop skills, whether it be through coding or just learning fundamental computing skills. Um, but I would love to learn more about the area and get acclimated with um, growing a network here. So we'll love mentoring. Awesome, anyone else? I see still a few coming in. Emmy said Athena Health is looking. Joy is looking for some DEI opportunities. Taryn has quite a few rules for Apex. So anyone else looking for jobs too that wants to talk about their skills? Actually, I am looking for DNI. <laughs> I saw that on there. I'm like, oh, it sounds like I'm looking to hire somebody. I'm actually looking, um, I have a consulting business, but I'm also always looking for full-time jobs at the same time. So for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and uh, learning and development. So anything that does anything with workshops, training, um, that's usually under the umbrella of HR, or maybe a separate diversity, equity, and inclusion team. Thank you. Awesome. 
Okay, well, we will get the rest of these out there. And reminder, if you are an AWT member, uh, you get access to the Slack channel where you can post these in the job board, whether you're looking or hiring, and it's a great way to make those immediate connections. But again, we will get these out to everyone. So thanks for sharing. I'll pass it over. I think we're talking about our boss ladies next. Is that correct? Yes. yes. So this month's boss lady is Angela Lee. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to make this event, but we are so excited to have her as one of our AWT volunteers. She's been helping with the marketing group and she's just been a huge, tremendous help. If you've seen um, our event graphics, um, those are all done by Angela and they look great. She also helped us with our boss lady certificate, which was really kind of funny and timely seeing as she, got that boss lady certificate uh, out there and she's the first one to receive it. So all of our boss ladies from this year, you will be receiving yours so that you can um, have that to share on social media or just keep for yourself. And if you've been previously awarded a boss lady and it wasn't in this year, you can also reach out and request one. So there's that. <laughs> and also uh, Angela has really helped us with our survey. And I think uh, Denise, correct me if I'm wrong, but we still have a few days left on our survey. Yes, it closes on May 7th. So there is definitely still some time to uh, get your response recorded. Yep. So we've sent, we've sent that to our contact list. Um, we're trying to use that just so that we can get some demographics and you know, just learn a little bit more about our organization. Um, so please, if you have the time, we would greatly appreciate it if you filled that out. And there is a raffle. So you could win a prize. So check your email for that. And also, we're all, as Shay mentioned earlier, we're always looking for volunteers. Um, we are looking for a virtual programs director. Den Denise, who is our current virtual programs director, um, has taken on the role as the marketing director. And so we need help finding, uh, giving her some support there. Always looking for speaker lead assistance and a social media volunteer. That's always something that we try to keep on top of. You can reach out to Lacey Michelle or at uh, volunteer at awtaustin.org. And then also we are interested in finding out who either volunteers or active members who are interested in joining the board. Um, if you could reach out to Heather at awtaustin.org for interest in that. We certainly encourage any, any boss ladies um, who normally have already really contributed to this organization. If you're interested in contributing more to this organization, please reach out to Heather. We'd love to get you more involved. Okay. Um, Taryn, are you going to do the membership? I think this slide is for you. Yes, yes. Um, well, I wanted just to say Thank you again so much, Nicole. That was such a great presentation and I hope you guys got all the education out of this. And I look forward to um, networking further with some of the people that I got to network uh, in, the, in the original slides. Um, but just wanted to give you guys a highlight. Um, um, so once a month, we do host events like this for members and non-members alike, including intelligent conversations, networking events, happy hours, fundraisers for Girl Start and Dress for Success, tech talks, and we also do expos and conferences. Um, as an AWT member, you receive free events right now to all the events throughout the year and utilizing our Slack channel for further networking and posting of jobs. Um, so for membership, uh, it's 60 a year for the entire year. And for students, we actually give a discount of just 30, now, um, 30 for the year. So um, if you are interested in getting connected on AWT membership, um, please don't hesitate and give me a shout on membership at awtaustin.org um, or connect with me on LinkedIn, whatever. If you want to talk with me, give me a shout. I am my, I'm an open door. <laughs> so um, yeah. We have anything else on the to-do list, Denise? Nope, I think that's it. Uh, we have our events 
that are coming up for May and June listed. So keep an eye out for the mentor list that will get posted very soon. We're in the process of getting the rest of our mentors uh, sorted out, but you will hopefully be able to see the speakers and their topics very soon on the website. And But you can already register for that event if you'd like to do that too. Yep, Shana, I've been hard at work this week sorting out the mentors, getting them interested. So um, please sign up for that. It's a great event. Um, and Denise, I don't know if you saw, somebody requested that we put the uh, link to the survey in the chat so people can fill that out now. If we can do that, that might be helpful. And that'll um, and then we can get the, the email that goes out yeah, to Yeah, the recap email. Out. But while it's top of mind, it might be easier for people. So. Uh, on that note, I also want to thank Nicole. I got a lot out of tonight. Just remember to keep my cool. Sometimes, as you mentioned, it's hard in the, in the moment to do that. Um, but uh, I thank you very much for speaking for us tonight. Um, it, it takes a lot of courage to come into a group of, of you know, 25, 30 plus people and, and give a big talk on, on something where you can be quite vulnerable. And so I want to thank you very much for speaking with us tonight. Oh, and I see Denise put the link in the in the chat. So, okay. Well, I hope to see all of you on May twenty fifth. Hope y'all have a great night. Thanks, ladies. Thanks. Thank you.